Edward entered the office of Charles Hughes, partner in Hughes and Kearney solicitors, as a stout secretary opened the door for him. He had not heard of this august Belfast law firm before, until a formal letter invited him to this meeting. He sat down opposite Mr Hughes, who was organising stacks of paper. He licked his index finger and leafed through more sheets. His dark, slick back hair appeared to be thinning. He took off his half-moon glasses and looked up at Edward, with sharp but welcoming eyes. Good afternoon, Mr Kelly. Thank you for coming. Charlotte, would you fetch us tea, please? Edward reached across the copious desk to meet the hand that had been the recipient of Mr Hughes's licking. Pleasure, releasing his grip and sitting back in his chair before accepting an offer of a cigarette from Hughes. As you may know, the last will and testimony of your great uncle Frederick Kelly was read last week. I have news for you. Oh, what's that? You see, I didn't really know him. In fact, I hadn't made the funeral, which I'm a little embarrassed about, lighting a cigarette and blowing out the match. Well, <clears throat> clearing his throat. Mr. Kelly, you have inherited his estate. Edward stared blankly at Hughes. His estate? Your uncle was a rather canny man and managed to solve certain inheritance tax issues. So he set up a trust with his property and goods and made you sole heir. That includes his home in Killock. What? That country pile he lived in by St John's Point? Still wide-eyed. The very one! Smiling at how the penny was starting to drop for Edward. But I only met him once as a child. We had very little to do with him. He was known to be a bit, hmm, eccentric by the family. You must have made quite an impression on him back then, said Hughes. Now, if you will sign these papers, you will be the new trustee and the keys are yours, handing him a pen as a tray of tea and biscuits was delivered to the desk. Walking back to his workplace at Telephone House, where he was an engineer, he mentally composed his tenancy termination letter to his landlord. A bunch of keys and papers were stuffed in his satchel. That weekend, Edward drove for just under an hour in his Morris Oxford to his new home. The last mile was a winding road that brought him to the gates, where he undid the padlock and drove in, disturbing a flock of geese on the grass. Inside, a grandfather clock ticked in the hallway, and the house felt cold. Even on this warm spring day, a quick inspection took him back to pre-war days of no running water or electricity. Perhaps a shared home in Belfast hadn't been so bad after all. It felt more like 1853 than 1953. A note from a Mrs Briggs who had been employed as Freddie's housekeeper was on the large kitchen table. She was going to stop in later that afternoon and show him some of the things a new owner needed to know and directed him to a cupboard where matches and fire lighting equipment were stored. With his outgoings reduced, he'd have no trouble keeping on a housekeeper for this place. Within a few weeks, Edward had gotten his hands dirty, planting new rose bushes, buying chickens to run around in the rear yard for his eggs, and hiring the services of a labourer to help him cut down a tree he felt would put the house at risk in a winter storm. He didn't mind the two hours of car journeys to work and back. It was a pleasant contrast to the city to return to a coastal retreat. What he hadn't bargained for was the reaction from some of the locals to his refurbishments. The chief lighthouse keeper paid him a visit the week following the tree felling. Did you know this was a tree of local folklore? Sucking on his pipe and wrapping the tree stump with his red knuckles. Edward looked at him helplessly, figuring he had best listen and get this over with. 
Didn't you know of your great uncle's work on studying and writing about the myths of Morn? Loch Shanna or the Loch of the Fox? Uh, no sir, I didn't. I've really not got a lot of information to go on about Freddy. Feeling like he was in the headmaster's study. When the mist closes in, the great hunter called Sheila can be seen haunting the loch. She rides on her horse, chasing the fox into the loch that led to her death, staring rather severely at Edward. And then there's Deirdre of the Sorrows, the most beautiful woman in Ireland, tricked into marrying a king who had killed her lover. I think I need to go through his papers, maybe? You would do well to study them if you want to be nature and create and destroy. Best to know what's about here first. Cup of tea? Tea? No, but I'll take something stronger, young man. <laughs> he didn't skip a beat upgrading that offer. Edward had seen the formidable drinks cabinet, but he wasn't much of a drinker himself, so had no idea what to offer. Name your poison and I'll see what we have, as he called Mrs. Briggs. Clinking port glasses, the keeper, whose name was Jerry, toasted him. To the new keeper of the secrets. What secrets? Edward asked. The ones you're great uncle was curating. I'll show you, young man. They walked across the hall to the library and Jerry made a beeline for a large notebook on a tall shelf. These ones. As near as possible, a complete history of all the myths of the Kingdom of Morn. It's between you to finish the research and us lighthouse keepers to verify. Tapping his nose. We are the ones who have witnessed many of these legends firsthand. Before he could speak, Jerry vanished before his eyes, and the empty pork glass toppled over on the table next to where he stood. <laughs>